This is Wellness by Designs and I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Christine Otobre, and today we'll be discussing optimal body composition. Welcome to Wellness by Designs. Christine, how are you going? I'm great, thanks. How are you? An absolute pleasure. Now, this is something that interests me greatly as I age, mature, now age. Um, so, but first, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Because you're a registered nurse, you're also a naturopath. Tell us about how you blend those two or indeed keep them separate. Uh, well, I do blend them just by practicing integratively. Um, so, with my registered nursing, it was uh, not fitness related. So, I specialized in cardiac. Um, and then I went into neonatal intensive care, but I guess all throughout that, I've always had a love of fitness, um, and have always been into living a healthy lifestyle, eating good nutrition. Um, so I guess my nursing side has probably helped me look at things a little bit more clinically and enabled me to read blood tests, um, as well as get into contact with a lot of, uh, specialists that I use for referrals for clients. So that's how I kind of combine um, both sides together because I love looking at okay. things um, clinically and diagnostically, um, but treating uh, with natural treatments. Great. Um, two very interesting, although diverse specialities, cardiac and neonatal IC. Mm, yes. <laughs> so you would have seen some traumatic, <clears throat> if not devastating, conditions there, like, you know, um, neonatal uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, NEC, um, mm. along with, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, people laboring with their cardiac output, if not dying from issues with cardiac. Is mm. that where the love for natural medicines started? Did it start earlier? Why do natural uh, Well... To be honest, when I, so I guess going back a little bit even further, um, so I was raised quite unconventionally. Uh, my mum was a bit of a hippie and she did aid work. So I grew up in third world countries in India, Mexico, um, Thailand, Korea, <laughs> wherever she wanted to go, we'd go with her. Um, and then okay. I ended up carrying on that into my teen years as well. And initially when I was deciding what I wanted to do, it was to study naturopathy. But then I was guided um, by a career counsellor saying there wasn't much financial return in naturopathy and they advised me to do uh, nursing because I could put my humanitarian aid um, history, I guess, into practice and maybe go back overseas and, and work as a registered nurse in Frontiers or something like that. So when I was younger, that was my aspirations of what I wanted to do. Um, so I okay. guess as I went through my career, um, my love for natural health still stayed and I ended up going full circle and studying naturopathy at the end of the day anyway. <laughs> right, got it. So the blending, I, I mean, it must have been a real chore for you. I was so anti natural medicine when I was nursing, so ignorant, so arrogant. Now I'm not so ignorant, but um, you had this knowledge right from the get-go that there was something more than that, that medical bottle that there was something more to be done for patients, particularly in countries that can't afford expensive pharmaceutical medicines. They have to rely on natural medicines. Mm. So is that yeah, where it was sort um, of um, cemented or? Um, I think a lot of it was cemented through nutrition, um, you know, and we all know that with uh, natural health and getting results at all with our our body composition or our health, it all starts by the food that we eat. Um, and I think in um, conventional medicine, you know, specifically cardiac patients and what you feed your patients in hospital, like the diet is just horrendous, what's available to patients. Um, and I found that in, you know, uh, the Royal Children's Hospital or, or NICU, like the, the food options are just also processed and commercialised. Um, and really health starts in our gut and from the food that we eat. Um, and they don't even teach that in medicine, really. They don't teach nutrition. Uh, so I think that's, that's very lacking um, in, in the preventative health side. 
You know, one thing that really saddens me is they've done research into how much money it would cost to have truly nutritious food, and it's not that much more. It can be done equitably. Mm. It can be done viably, financially viably. Why it isn't done befuddles me because in the end they're going to get less rehospitalizations, greater health oh. outcomes. It's, it, to me it's insanity. It's just why? But yeah. anyway... We'll leave that for another podcast. <laughs> now we've got it. We've got a sort of, we've got a blend from cardiac and neonatal intensive care to specialising in body composition. What what took you there? What was it to that made you specialise? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, well, I've always been into fitness, and uh, way back when I was doing my nursing, still. Um, I started to become a little bit more focused on achieving specific results, such as, you know, getting abs, um, maybe wanting to do a body competition. Uh, and then I met my husband who specialized in those things. So I enrolled into his personal training program, became a client. Um, yeah. and, and I guess I started to work a lot on, um, what served me specifically. So trying to optimize my energy levels. I had a level of adrenal um, fatigue as well from my nursing and all the shift work that I did. So I had really bad insomnia um, and I was, I was quite exhausted all the time, sometimes to where I wouldn't even be able to structure a sentence properly um, or really had a high level of brain fog. Um, and then I found that taking out certain foods such as gluten really helped to clear a lot of that out. Uh, so I, I became really passionate and um, focused on finding out what worked for me with my nutrition and just wanting to live the lifestyle that I wanted to do and um, focus on changing my health to be able to do that. So I guess um, that's what I always look for with my clients is, you know, they want to achieve a certain lifestyle and uh, it's up to me to help them to be able to do that by supporting their health. Yeah, great. And so take us through an intake and assessment. What sort of things do you look at? Do you do, you do DEXA scans first up or do you look at a, a lengthy questionnaire? Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess first of all, it's really finding out what the client wants to achieve and looking at their lifestyle. Um, I send them a food diary to keep before they come in. So it's a food and symptom diary that they keep for a week. So I find out um, a lot about their schedule, what time they eat their meals, their routine, and then the foods that they eat and if um, any of the symptoms that they're having are correlating with those foods as well. Um, and then, of course, that includes their health symptoms too. Uh, if they're coming to do like a comp prep or weight loss from uh, the gym. So my husband has a gym. Um, then he uses caliper testing. I'm not sure if you're aware of, uh, the 12 site caliper test. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, um, it's a skin fold test and they measure certain sites of the body and that represents different hormonal, um, processes. So whether it's detoxification, aromatization, um, how a person sleeps, it's, it's something that was uh, founded by Charles Poliquin and he was a strength coach um, who worked with a lot of athletes. Uh, so he did this practice. So I guess in monitoring a person's body fat percentage, um, that's what they initially start with and they have that done every two weeks to see how they're progressing. <laughs> Gotcha. So I'm familiar with, you know, certain ones that, forgive me, skin fold calipers were a long time ago when I used to be fit, but things like, you know, this side, the triceps, obviously mm -hmm. others, um, abdom abdominal either side. Um, but what can you tell from the different sites, certainly in changes in those, uh, in those readings? Yeah. So, um, I mean, again, for me, coming as a clinical nurse, um, you know, and my husband first mentioned the test to me, I was like, oh, I don't know, Tell, show me the research. Um, but it does, and I always do blood tests as well and other functional tests for my clients too. And it's very interesting how everything correlates and the results all come up the same as to what um, 
is reflective of the client's symptoms. So like abdominal is reflective of your cortisol, um, aromatization is usually triceps. If a person can tolerate a more high carbohydrate diet, then it's due to your subscapular or your super iliac. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how that actually does correlate with a person's blood wow. pathology or to how they're functioning as well. Um, I can't say it's very founded in research. It's probably something more just practically that I see. Right, but it's got some basis. That's quite amazing. I've never, ever thought of that. Yeah, yeah, it, um, it definitely does work. And it's a really good way to see how a person is responding to their treatment um, nutritionally and with their training as well. Um, and how it's all working in with their lifestyle. Like, you know, if a person's overtraining or if something's going on in their life that's increasing their cortisol, um, it's really hard to get that abdominal section down. Um, yeah, so it's, it is interesting to see how it all, all measures up at the end. That's really interesting. So it's not just a general um, uh, loss of the caliper size, if you like, um, the readings over time, but it can be more specific depending on what's happening to that person. That's really yeah, quite, yeah, let's say, let's not yeah. say diagnostic, but certainly management. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of um, supplementation and things, especially with, uh, you know, personal trainers, um, they use it a lot to see whether they need to increase a person's carbohydrates or if they're not so carbohydrate tolerant. Um, you know, if a person's training too much, if they're not sleeping and they need some more magnesium, um, if they have too much uh, xenoestrogens maybe in the detoxification pathways need uh, supporting. So, yeah, it's, um, it's quite interesting how it all uh, works together. Gotcha. Now you're talking about skin calipers. Some people use DEXA mm -hmm. scans. Do you prefer the mm -hmm. skin calipers over DEXA? Uh, I would prefer DEXA scans, but they're expensive for the client to get all the time. Um, yeah. So, you know, a big way of keeping a client compliant and on a consistent plan is also managing their pocket as well. So um, we have uh, done like comparatives between the DEXA and the caliper testing. And we probably find as far as body fat testing, it's about 4% off what is usually accurate. Um, wow. So like a, you know, body a caliper site might come back with a person's 8% body fat, where in reality they might be 12%. Um, yeah, so, gotcha. Yeah, it does measure differently. Yeah, but that's reasonable given the cost of repeated DEXA scans. Um, what about though doing maybe in a, you know, a type one personality, type A personality uh, patient might just say, okay, well, look, let's do a, a DEXA, let's do the calipers and we'll compare. And then mm -hmm. mostly you'll use the calipers and maybe a year later you'll say, okay, let's revisit the DEXA. Do you ever look at that sort of thing for some patients? Yeah, um, they do. Like definitely you get a lot of clients that are very number driven and, you know, if some can, if they can do it, then they'll just do the DEXA scan anyway. Um, I think at the end of the day is it's really using to see it's really used to see how the person is progressing so it doesn't really matter if it's four percent out per se but as long as the measurements are going in the right direction that's what it's really about cool and so when we're talking about supplementation um you know you're talking about people who might be in cortisol overdrive because of stress like how do you Actually, I'll ask a more general question. What supplements do you find have merit given your medical background, given your, you know, nursing background? And I know how we think. We think like it either works or it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. Which ones have real merit? Um, well, I use a lot of adaptogens. So I use a lot of uh, herbal tinctures with my clients, I find. I find them very effective. I've never had anyone come back to me and say, this hasn't worked. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's evidence-based practice really when you get those results for clients. 
So yep. using like ashwagandha, um, triganda that Designs for Health have, that's really good too. If you're using a herbal tincture, then, you know, supporting the immune system, astragalus, uh, with ania, romania, ginseng is really good with athletes as well. Um, yeah, those are my probably main adaptogens that I would use um, just for supporting cortisol regulation. Yeah, cool. And you were mentioning the gut, how important food is. Obviously tied in with that is the microbiota. How much weight do you give, forgive the pun, how much weight do you give to balancing the microbiota? Yeah, um, heaps. I, like a, a lot. It's interesting to see how many of my clients come through and they all do a microbiome test um, because they all have symptoms um, and mm. I much prefer to do the testing to get a little bit more specific about what's going on. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy about the microbiome testing um, might overdiagnose. So, but I, I do find that it usually does, like the results do usually correlate with the symptoms. Um, and if you get a person's digestion right before they start on a comp prep, or for weight loss, like you're halfway there already. They can just tolerate the whole competition prep so much easier and the results are a lot faster as well. Gotcha. A couple of times you've said comp prep. Can you explain that term? No, oh, sorry. Um, so competition prep, if a person is doing a physique show or so a physique show is a natural bodybuilding show. So I usually only take on natural competitors because I don't know much about um, people that compete with steroids. Um, so I prefer to only go with what I know. Um, so natural bodybuilding is they'll either do a physique show where it's a little bit more muscular um, or it's a sports model or now they have bikini shows. So it's all about presentation physically as well as how you show yourself on stage. Um, and in the fitness world, it's... it's uh, very um yeah it's very familiar is that the word to use <laughs> people do it a lot <laughs> yeah yeah but it's once also once they you know, start on their path it's you always see oh, i'm thinking about doing a fitness show so yeah but it's also as you say it's so competitively it's so competitive and it's fine edged we're talking about you know, a difference of like one or two percent in body fat when to to get them ripped, and they'll do anything mm. to do that. Sometimes horribly at the expense of reasonable hydration, things like that. Mm. I know what happens on competition day, but take us through what happens in this um, group of athletes. Yeah, um, I guess that's why myself and my husband love what we do and we're so passionate about it because there is a way to do it where you're not compromising the person's health. Um, and I know in the naturopathic field, it's, it's a big no, no to do, um, you know, competition prep or do, you know, where you're getting yourself down to that much percentage body fat. Um, definitely doing it for over a long period of time can be, um, harmful to a patient's health. Mm. But if you, um, if you know what you're doing, you can get there and then pull yourself out quick enough where you're not doing much damage. Um, so it really depends on how the client comes to you first off uh, with their level of health and to how they are physically as to the time period that they're going to compete in. Um, so there's probably about four different um, competition phases throughout the year. So it's really just seeing where that person is at as to what time they can compete in. And a lot of that has to do with the guidance of the coach that they're working with. And that's the personal trainer. Um, and if they've got health issues and they send them to myself as well. Um, and if they're not in a good level of health, we'll just say you won't be ready to compete or we're not going to support you to compete. Um, and it's very important to have that that level of honesty with them as well because there's no way you want to bring a client to the stage and they're good physically but then they're going to fall apart afterwards um, and that's very yeah. against our values too. Gotcha, great, nice to hear. Um, I have also have to ask female competitors. Now I've spoken with, mm -hmm. you know, Kira Sutherland, Lara Bryden about this. They've done webinars about it. I've, I've spoken with uh, Natalie Burke about it, about 
you know, too low a fat content in a woman's body, restricting menstruation and the normal signaling of menstruation. How do you manage that one? That's a real sticky web, that one. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there are some women that can definitely handle it more than others. And it does have to do a lot with balancing the hypothalamic pituitary axis as well. Um, and that stress response and that feedback loop to your hormones. So supporting them through adapt with adaptogens throughout their prep um, is very important. And just keeping that, um, keeping them at that sweet spot for not too long. And then after their comp prep, making sure that they're having the appropriate amount of fats and calories without bringing them up too high where it's too much on their gut, as well as a high level of inflammation, having all those different foods after they've been at a deficit for so long. So um, it, it is a little like it, you know, it's very case dependent. It's very individualized. Um, but there is a method to do it where you don't have to stay in that deficit for too much, um, yeah, for too long of an amount of time to actually cause sustainable damage. Cool. And what about things like injuries? I mean, these people train with horrendous mm -hmm. weights sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's both isometric, isotonic exercises that they do, you know, invariable, like, you know, pecs and things like that, biceps. I've seen... I've, I've seen a movie of a bicep ripping um, and yeah. it's not nice. Um, how do you combat injuries? How do you keep these people um, competition fit? Uh, well, so that's managed by my husband and the personal trainer. So when they come through the gym, they always have a assessment, um, a structural assessment, and it's bilateral. So seeing how they function on either side and then all together as well. Um, and it's always, it's never about going above your means. It's getting the most out of what you can do. Um, so it's, it's definitely, and you know, we're not a big advocate of online training for that purpose. It, it was, um, you know, we kind of had to do it during COVID and the pandemic because that's all we had. Um, but it's it's quite challenging to work with someone online when you can't see how they perform an exercise, or you know, if they're doing the right techniques or if they're going to injure yourself, injure themselves. Um, so we work one on one with the client just to make sure they're performing each exercise as well um and and i guess any injuries are managed you know by getting them to see a physiotherapist or an osteopath you know if something does happen um and then we work together on making sure they're doing the remedial exercises to yeah repair that i guess more on my side as a naturopath um injuries or things that i'd see with my clients if they're you know, kind of not going in the right direction would be, you know, hypothalamic amenorrhea, so losing their cycle too early, um, or eating disorders such as being at a deficit with their calories and then they start binge eating or yeah. um, developing some sort of dysmorphia where after their comp prep, they're not actually refeeding their body how they should because they want to keep looking like they do for a longer amount of time. Um, so a lot of it is working with the client's mindset as well um, all throughout their journey too. I'm so glad you said that because it's such an issue when people get stuck into what looks good. I mean, in my mm -hmm. mind, a lot of these bodybuilders look better after competition when they've got a more normal body. I mean, I Chris totally Emsworth, agree. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but... Uh, um, I have to ask, though, about red flags. Um, now, you know, we've spoken about dehydration, but the, to go goes along with that, you've got electrolyte disturbances, you've got nutrient deficiencies, iron deficiencies, you've got delayed onset muscle soreness, which might in some people seem trivial, but this can hurt. So DOMS, mm -hmm. um, iron deficiency anemia, um, and, you know, you mentioned anemias. When do the red flags you know, ding, when do, they, when do you start to go, hang on, there's something else wrong here? Uh, well, so we do do the blood pathology testing at the beginning of, um, you know, their journey or their initial assessment. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on what, how, they, how they are going um, and how they're progressing as well, like we always, so they have 
two week check ins all the time, you know, with the form to say, you know, how the energy levels been, what are your stools doing, what's your digestion doing, your sex drive. So it is definitely assessed all throughout. Um, and then if they're not getting the results, so they start surfacing with something, something such as exhaustion or they're not recovering, then you start to look at their nutrition, you know, what are they lacking, first of all? Are they absorbing what they're getting? Um, optimizing that, if that's still not working, then other supplementation that you can use to support it. Um, and then if they do need blood testing again, well, we always do referrals, so that's, that's done as well. So then you get a, a real look of what's actually going on instead of the guessing game. I know this is a whole podcast to talk about, but I need to ask you about some specific supplements. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, a lot of people will use creatine, uh, glutamine, uh, the branch chain amino acids, citrulline, um, as, uh, as well as on top of your general proteins, whether that be mm -hmm. whey or plant-based or whatever. How do you manage that? what they use when mm. they stop because creatine sucks in water into the muscle fiber. Mm -hmm. Do they stop like on the day or be day before competition? How do you actually use the use of these supplements, manage the use of these I supplements? I don't use any of them. <laughs> They're None. all just marketing type to me. No, I don't use right. any of them. Um, so we're very, gotcha. we're very low on all the, on all the sport hype marketing supplements. Um, we use yep. Designs for Health Active Body Collagen as a preferred way of them getting like a protein supplement. Um, yep. If they need to use it as a meal replacement, then we use um, True Protein, which is a grass-fed whey, um, and it's just pure whey. Um, and as far as recovery goes, then it's just an amino acid um, supplement by Thorne that we use. Um, sometimes branch chain amino acids, if people feel like they're not, um, they don't have enough oomph through their, uh, through their training session or if they need a little bit more yeah, energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But really a lot of it comes down to their lifestyle, how much sleep they're getting um, and the nutrition that they're having. I mean, if all those essentials are supported, then there's no real reason that they need all those you know, additional sports supplements. It's, it's just all marketing to be totally honest. Interesting. Interesting. Christine, this is obviously, this is a massive topic, you know, that whole supplement thing, that's a thing on its own, but um, mm -hmm. I like the responsible use that you talk about. And obviously as a naturopath, as a nurse, looking at the food is first and then importantly, taking into account their mindset. And it's not, that males don't go through this. Males do suffer from nervo um, anorexia nervosa, but it's more has a greater preponderance in females. So I'm so glad mm -hmm. that you look at their mental state as well. It's really encouraging, really interesting to see. Lovely, lovely how to see you care for your patients. Thank you so much for taking us through body composition issues today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. And it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. You can get all the show notes of today's podcast and listen to all the other podcasts on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Wellness by Designs.